Well, let's open up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we do come before you, we ask that your Holy Spirit would remind us that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that our bodies have been given over to you. The moment you came into our lives, you purchased us. You redeemed us from our sins, and you have set us free. And Lord, we want to walk in that newness of life that we have in the whole in the Holy Spirit. We pray that your word would speak to our hearts, and as we go through this amazing book of Exodus, we thank you for uh, the way you revealed yourself to Moses and the Israelites and how you've uh, revealed yourself in so many amazing, powerful ways uh, to us from your living word. And we just praise you and thank you for this time together. Pray you'd give traveling mercies to all those who are coming down from the mountain here shortly. And Lord, for the high school uh, youth group that's going down to Mexico, may you uh, bless them as they're getting ready to cross the border right now and uh, bless their time there. Uh, in San Vicente, and we just pray that you would keep them safe and strong and use their gifts and talents for your glory, and we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. All right, you can turn in your Bibles to Exodus 38. Um, I don't know about you, but I've been certainly blessed as we've been going through this amazing account of God's power, His protection, His provision for the Israelites. Uh, from God revealing himself to Moses at the, the, you know, from the midst of the burning bush to how God brought the ten plagues upon Pharaoh and upon the land of Egypt when he set them free. And then you know, Moses leading two, and a th two to three million Israelites out of Egypt into the wilderness. How God parted the Red Sea when Pharaoh's army was chasing after them. And when they get through on dry land, it says God brings the walls of water down upon the you know, army of Pharaoh, and they all drown in the sea. And so God has brought them to the, the base of Mount Sinai. Uh, he's been giving them manna from heaven, water from the rock, just one ama amazing miracle after another. I mean, manna every day, twice on Friday, so they didn't gather anything on Saturday on the Sabbath. But God would call Moses to come to the top of Mount Sinai where he gave him the Ten Commandments. And then when he comes down with the two tablets of the Ten Commandments, uh, the Israelites talked um, Aaron, Moses' brother, into making a gold calf. And so they build the, he makes his gold calf and they worship this thing. This is the God that brought us out of Egypt. And as a result, God strikes down 3,000 Israelites because of their disobedience, their idolatry. And so Moses goes into intercession mode on behalf of the people, and God renews his covenant with them. And Moses goes back up for another 40 days and 40 nights, and he gets the uh, new uh, tablets of stone that he brings back down with him. And this time when Moses comes down, we're told that his face was glowing from being in the presence of the Lord. Uh, the people are very humbled at this point after uh, God striking down 3,000 of their fellow Israelites. And then we saw in chapter 26, Moses sends out the word. Um, it's time to take up an offering. And so because of their willing hearts, and God emphasizes that, only those who have willing hearts, they bring all these different things, items of gold, silver, and bronze, and all this art, you know, clothing and different things to build the tabernacle. And so much is brought, and again, you'll never see this on TBN. Moses had to say, stop, no more money, no more stuff, we got enough. And so they had plenty to build the tabernacle. And so there were not only willing givers, but there were also willing workers, as we saw last time in chapter 27. And so the two always need to go hand in hand, willing givers, willing workers. But the amazing you know, thing is, this must have been a, a, just a glorious time. And it, well, it was, as we'll see at the end of the book, where God's presence, his glory, would just come upon them and come upon this tabernacle in a powerful way. So we've already covered much of this, uh, what we're going to read here in chapters 25 to 30. So if you want a more in-depth study of these things, like the sockets and the rings and all these different articles they made, go back and listen to chapters 25 to 30. So I'll go through some of these sections rather quickly. So look at chapter 38, starting in verse 1. First thing we have, and you can put that on the screen, the altar of burnt offering. It says, He made the altar of burnt offering of acacia wood. Five cubits was its length, five cubits its width. It was square. So it's about seven and a half feet each direction, about five feet high. It's three cubits high. He made 
its horns on its four corners. As you can see there, the horns were of one piece with it, and he overlaid it with bronze. The horns is where they would, you know, tie up the animal that was going to be sacrificed. They would, you know, drain out the blood. They would cook it. That was a, it's a giant barbecue. God loves a barbecue. He loves this aroma of meat, flesh being cooked. And uh, he loves the aroma when our flesh is being cooked as well, by the way, when we're um, putting it to death. And so it says, uh, verse 3, he made all the utensils for the altar, pans, shovels, basins, forks, Fire pans, all its utensils he made of bronze. He made a grate of bronze network for the altar under its rim, uh, midway from the bottom. You can see that you know that grate should be a little bit lower, but maybe it was adjustable, like your barbecue. And he made the poles of acacia wood, overlaid them with bronze. Then he put the poles into the rings on the sides of the altar with which to bear it. He made the altar hollow with uh, with boards. So. Again, all the furnishings in the tabernacle inside were all made from acacia wood overlaid with pure gold. Now, this is on the outside of the tabernacle, and everything out there was bronze. You have this that was bronze. You'd have the water basin that was bronze. And bronze speaks of judgment. This is where uh, judgment was poured out on that sacrificial animal because that animal was being sacrificed for the sins of the people. This altar represents the cross. As I've said many times as we go through Exodus, all these things point to Jesus. Jesus on the cross. That was the altar that he hung on for our sins, shedding his blood, dying in our place as he hung on the altar, the cross. Now, he died once and for all for all of our sins, but he has also given each one of us who are his followers our own personal cross. What am I talking about? Well, Jesus says this in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Now, some say, oh, I got this burden to carry, this cross, it's a burden to carry. And that's not what he's referring to. He's talking about anytime your flesh is wanting to take over once again. You're a new creation in Christ, but still we wrestle with the flesh and the spirit. And when your flesh is trying to take over, you need to reckon that old man dead. You need to crucify that old man. So whenever that urge comes upon you, you need to take that to the cross. Die to yourself. Put your focus on Jesus. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1.18, it says, The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. In other words, that sanctification process that we're all in, justified just as if you've never sinned that's how god sees you in christ you can't get any more saved than you are right now but we're in the sanctification process because i'm not perfect yet none of us are if you think you are you're deceiving yourself because none of us are perfect until we get to heaven and then we'll be in our glorified state so right now we go through the sanctification process so the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God because we nail our flesh to the cross whenever it rears its ugly head. And we just crucify that desire once again. Look at verse 8. He made the laver of bronze and its base of bronze from the bronze mirrors of the serving women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Again, we see the bronze laver. And it was made from the mirrors that the women brought from Egypt. And so again, they filled this with water. Anytime the priest would go into the tabernacle, have to wash his hands. Anytime he came out, they had to wash their hands. And so again, this speaks of Jesus. He's the living water. He's the one that has cleansed us of all of our sins. Um, we are clean because of Christ. You know, we are clean because of the blood of Christ. He has given us all that we need for life and godliness, as Aaron prayed earlier. And we, he's given us the Word of God. Ephesians 5.26 says we're being washed in the water of the Word. We have the rivers of living water, the Holy Spirit cleansing us and renewing us. And we have the blood of Jesus. 1 John 1.7 says the blood of Christ cleanses us, present tense, of all sin. So we have no excuse for walking around defeated in sin because we can be cleansed, refreshed, renewed day by day because of the bronze laver, because of the washing of the water of the Word. Now, they washed their hands and feet in this. You remember when Jesus, again, he fulfilled this, John chapter 13, 
uh, right after they took the Lord's Supper, he instituted communion, and then he goes around, he girds himself with a towel, gets a basin of water, washes the disciples' feet. And as he gets to Peter, Peter's like, you're not going to do that to me. And far be it from you, Lord. And Jesus says, if I don't wash you, you have no part in this ministry. And so Peter's like, okay, give me a bath. And he's like, no, you don't need a bath. You're clean. You just need your feet washed because we live in a dirty world. And we pick up things just being in this sinful world. And so we need to be cleansed again continuously. And that's the message Jesus was giving them. We need to have our feet washed, our hands washed, our hearts, our minds washed through, again, the rivers of living water, the blood, and the word of God. Verse 9. Verses 9 to 20 uh, it speaks about this portable fence that goes all the way around. you got a picture of that. You can see the fencing. It's 150 feet long and on both sides. It's 75 feet wide, and it's got all these silver caps on each one of them. It's got all these different rings, and that's what this section goes through, all these different rings and caps and you know, cords and all these things. And um, this is like the perimeter around. That's the outer courtyard of the tabernacle. And so that's what he's referring to here. And so again... It was a portable fence. Everything in this tabernacle was portable. It had to be broken down quickly. And they had all these hundreds of priests that would be carrying this stuff on poles as they would go wherever the cloud moved, the pillar of fire, the pillar of, pillar of cloud. Whenever the Lord moved, they had to pack everything up and follow the cloud. And then as soon as the cloud stopped, they had to reset up all these things once again. So it was a, a, a major ordeal, quite the offering, quite the uh, you know, picture here. Um, one thing we see, look at verse 18. It says, The screen for the gate of the court was woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread and of fine woven linen. The length was 20 cubits, and the height around, uh, along its width was 5 cubits, corresponding to the hangings of the court, so he's talking about the entrance. So on the very bottom left corner was an entrance into the courtyard. And then as you came to the tabernacle itself, there was an entrance into the holy place. Then inside of that was the veil. The Holy of Holies was beyond that veil. Some people see that pictured in Jesus again, who says, I am the way, the way in, the truth into the holy place and the life the life being in the Holy of Holies. That's where God met with the high priest, the Day of Atonement. And so, beautiful picture again of Jesus. Look at verse 21. This is the inventory of the tabernacle, the tabernacle of the testimony, which was counted according to the commandment of Moses for the service of the Levites by the hand of Ithamar, son of Aaron the priest, Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah made all the Lord that the Lord had commanded Moses. Again, Bezalel, he was gifted. The Holy Spirit came upon him, we're told. And we saw how he was the guy in charge of making everything, building everything. He oversaw the building project. He was like the main supervisor, very gifted in all these different things. Um, verse 23 says, And with him was Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach of the tribe of Dan an engraver and designer, a weaver of blue, purple, and scarlet thread of fine linen. Verse 24, all the gold that was used in all the work of the holy place, that is, the gold of the offering, was 29 talents and 730 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. In other words, all the gold that they collected was nearly 3,000 pounds of gold. I don't know what the, I, I can't do the math. What is gold going for now an ounce? Like $2,000 an ounce? You got, you got like 3,000 pounds of gold here. Do the math. That's a lot of gold. And then when Solomon builds the temple, a lot of these furnishings would go into the temple, but then the temple itself was made out of all more gold than everything else. So it was even, you know, 10 times more than what we see here. Uh, verse 25, And the silver from those who were numbered of the congregation was 100 talents and 1,775 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. So that's nearly five tons of silver. That's a lot of silver. And so these were the caps. These were used in a lot of different things around the outside of the sanctuary. And then he says in verse 
29, the offering of bronze was 70 talents and 2,400 shekels, so about three and a half tons of bronze used to make all these things. And with it, he made the sockets for the door of the tabernacle of the meeting, the bronze altar, the bronze grating for it, all the utensils for the altar, the sockets for the court all around, the bases for the court gate, all the pegs for the tabernacle and all the pegs for the court all around. So tent stakes, basically, holding the fence up on both sides, holding the tabernacle up. So there's a lot of things that go into building this amazing tabernacle. Verse, uh, chapter 39. This deals mostly with the priestly garments. Again, we went into detail in chapter 28 with all these things, so I'll go through this quickly as well. Of the blue, purple, and scarlet thread, they made garments of ministry for ministering in the holy place and made the holy garments for Aaron as the Lord had commanded Moses. And so again, we saw that all these Things for Aaron, these materials were the same thing used in the inner covering because over the tabernacle, there's four layers. The inner layer was beautiful, kind of like his robe, and it was to represent being in the presence of God. There were cherubim inside that covering, so they think they're in heaven. God's presence is there. And so he was representing the people before the Lord. It's like, I'm in heaven with God. Just so again, a beautiful uh, picture there, uh, beautiful garments that he would make. Um, verse 2, he made the ephod of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and of the fine woven linen. Um, it says they beat the gold into thin sheets and cut it into threads to work with it, with the blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and the fine linen into artistic designs. They made shoulder straps. So you can see that in the middle picture, the shoulder straps. Uh, together, it was coupled together at its two edges and the intricately woven band of his ephod that was on it was of the same workmanship, woven of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and of fine woven linen, as the Lord had commanded Moses. And they set onyx stones enclosed in settings of gold that were engraved as signets are engraved with the names of the sons of Israel. He put them on the shoulders of the ephod as a memorial stones for the sons of Israel as the Lord had commanded Moses. And so you can see the strap going up the back on the picture on the right. But on the very top are these two dark stones, they're called onyx stones. On each stone, six names of the tribes of Israel on one, the other six names of the tribes on the other one. And so represented as he was in the temple, he is carrying the Israelites along. You know, picture Jesus... And a lot of you have seen those pictures of Jesus, you know, carrying the lamb on his shoulders. He's our high priest. He's the chief shepherd. He carries us. It's like the footprints on the sand, you know, that, that poem there where, hey, Lord, how come there's only one set of footprints here? That's when I was in trouble. Where'd you go? And he goes, no, I was carrying you during that time when you were struggling, when you were hurting, when you were damaged, whatever it was, he carries us. And so that was carrying the burdens of the people as he would intercede on behalf of the people there in the tabernacle. Look at verse 8. And he made the breastplate artistically woven like the workmanship of the ephod of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread. They made the breastplate square by doubling it. A span was its length and a span its width when doubled. So in the middle picture, you see that little square over his chest. That was the breastplate. So the breastplate and the ephod became, no, they were basically just one. They, they were interlinked together and they would just be as one. And so they had 12 stones, three across, four rows of, of the stones here, as he mentions. Look at verse um, 10. It says, They set in it four rows of stones, a row with a sardius, a topaz, and an emerald was the first stone. The second row, a turquoise, a sapphire, and a diamond. The third row, a jacinth, an agate, and, a, uh, and an amethyst. In the fourth row, a barrel, an onyx, and a jasper. They were enclosed in settings of gold in their mountings. There were twelve stones according to the names of the sons of Israel, according to their names engraved like a signet, each one of them with its own name according to the twelve tribes. And so on each stone was the name of one of the twelve tribes. And so not only was the high priest carrying them on his shoulders, he was carrying them over his heart as he's ministering to the Lord. That was about nine-inch square little, you know, 
uh, breastplate that he's wearing there. And uh, again, Jesus has you on his heart. He loves you. He cares for you. Uh, God demonstrates his own love toward you in, while we were still sinners. He died for us. And so, again, a beautiful picture. Jesus is our high priest, and he carries us over his heart. Now, skip ahead to verse 22. It talks more about the robe. He made the robe of the ephod of woven work, all of blue. And there was an opening in the middle of the robe, like the opening in a coat of mail with a woven binding all around the opening so that it would not tear. And so you can see the, the blue goes all the way down the front and it would, you know, a hole in the middle and it goes down the back and then they would sash it up in the middle, tie it up in the middle there. But notice what it goes on to say. Um, verse 25, and they made bells of pure gold and put the bells between the pomegranates on the hem of the robe all around between the pomegranates. A bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate all around the hem of the robe to minister in as the Lord had commanded Moses. And so again, you can't really see it very well on here, but they would have gold bells at the hem, all the way around by his feet. Next to it was a pomegranate. What is pomegranate? Is it a vegetable? No, what is it? It's fruit. And so bell, fruit, bell, fruit, all the way around. And it's really a picture of 1 Corinthians 12. It's all about the gifts of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 13 is the fruit or love, the chapter on love. And then chapter 14 deals with the gifts of the Spirit again. And so you need to have that balance of the gifts and the fruit working together. You don't want to just say, I want all the gifts that God has for me. Well, you do want to say that, but it has to be tempered with love as well. God's agape love. You know, there's a lot of people like to go around and, well, I got this gift and they brag about it. Well, they're not walking in love because it should always point to Jesus. You know, the, the example there is 1 Corinthians 13. I think Paul had that picture in mind. This is what he says in verse 1. Um, where am I? <laughs> Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm nothing but what? Sounding brass or clanging cymbal. You know, if you just take two bells and hit them together, it's like ching, ching, it just clanks. But because of the fruit and the bells all the way around, as the priest moved, there was this constant harmony of sound. And the people outside could hear the priest moving from one place to another as he's working inside the tabernacle. And it was just this very beautiful, melodic, you know, harmony of sound. Uh, later on, it's not in the Bible, but history would say that they started putting a rope around the high priest on his foot, and they brought it all the way outside into the courtyard because if they ever heard the bell stop, they would say, uh-oh, he died. God struck him down. And so they wanted to be able to pull them out because nobody could go in there but the priests. Whether it ever happened, we're not really told. But it's a good picture here that we're reminded Jesus wants us to walk in the fruit and use the gifts and talents he's given us for his glory. Not just go around being a clanging cymbal, a sounding brass. It'd be like me getting on the drum set. You'd be going, get me out of here! Because I don't know how to play. Verse 27 they made tunics, artistically woven. Notice again, and we see this over and over again, of fine linen for Aaron and his sons. And God was very specific earlier in Exodus when they make these, do not use wool. He did not want them perspiring as much as he wanted them inspired while they're working for the Lord. Same is true for us. He doesn't want you working so hard that you're sweating. I mean, nothing wrong with that, but he wants you to be inspired as you work for the Lord. Not just doing a bunch of work for God, but being inspired by the Holy Spirit. And yeah, you might sweat while you're working for the Lord, but it's in the joy, it's in, in with peace, it's in the love of Jesus as you're serving the Lord. Verse 28, he says, A turban of fine linen, exquisite hats of fine linen, short trousers of fine woven linen. I like that. Short trousers. And a sash of fine woven linen with blue, purple, and scarlet thread made by a weaver as the Lord had commanded Moses. Then they made the plate of the holy crown of pure gold and wrote on it an inscription like the engraving of a signet. So this is what it was across his turban that he's wearing on his head. Holiness to the Lord. And they tied it to a 
blue cord to fasten it above the turban as the Lord had commanded Moses. So this is like a sign on his turban, holiness to the Lord. It was a constant reminder to Aaron, I'm serving holy God. And I'm doing this for holy God. And also, when the people see this on him, he's representing the holy God. And that's how we should be living. You know, if you have any Christian bumper stickers, that's this, basically what it is. This is a high-class bumper sticker. Gold, holiness to the Lord. You know, I've been behind some, I think they were Christians. It's like, I love Jesus. And they're throwing trash out the window. Or they're zipping by everybody, flipping people off. And I'm like, don't! Take that bumper sticker off, please. That's why I don't have a bumper sticker in my car. You know, <laughs> It's just easier that way. But be that as it may, you know, we should all live our lives with that same desire. I want Jesus to be glorified in all that I do, and I want other people to be edified in the things I do. And that's what we see with Aaron in that bumper sticker on his head made out of pure gold, holiness to the Lord. He's representing God. Verse 32, thus all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting was finished. Oh, man, that's awesome. And the children of Israel did according to all that the Lord had commanded Moses, so they did. I mean, this is awesome here. And they brought the tabernacle to Moses, so they got it all rolled up, ready to go. You know, the tent and all of its furnishings, its class, its boards, its bars, its pillars, and its sockets. The covering of ram skins dyed red. That was the second covering. The, over, the top covering was the badger skins, the veil of the covering, and the ark of the testimony with its poles in the mercy seat. That's what Indiana Jones was looking for. Remember in the first movie, the ark. Uh, the table and all its utensils and the showbread. So the gold table, they had the 12 loaves of bread on there. The pure gold lampstand with its lamp. That's what lit up the tabernacle inside, representing the Holy Spirit. Um, all of its utensils and the oil for light, the gold altar, the anointing oil, the sweet incense, the screen for the tabernacle door, the bronze altar that we looked at earlier, its grate of bronze, its poles and all its utensils, the laver with its base that had the water in it, the hangings of the court, its pillars and sockets, the screen for all the court gate, its cords, its pegs, all the utensils for the service of the tabernacle for the tent of meeting and the garments of ministry to minister in the holy place, the holy garments for Aaron the priest and his son's garments. So again, he's going through the whole list of everything they've done according to all the Lord had commanded Moses. So the children of Israel did all the work. Look at verse 43. Then Moses looked over all the work and indeed they had done it as the Lord had commanded, just so they had done it, and Moses blessed them. Now, don't miss this. I mean, this is a huge accomplishment. This is an amazing feat here, because in spite of all their grumblings and complainings, even up to this point, after their rebellion with the gold calf, here we see they come together, and they do everything it says as the Lord commanded. Just as God's word said, they follow through. The reason this is so important is because so much of the Old Testament is about the Israelites, the Jews, failing. And they grumbled. They did complain. They rebelled. This is why the ten northern tribes are taken into captivity by the Assyrians. And then 200 years later, or 150 years later, this is why Babylon came in and took them into captivity. Because they continue to rebel and disobey the Lord. But at this very moment, they have this great accomplishment. This is what James 1.22 is all about. It says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. They were doing what God commanded them to do. And Moses blessed them. I mean, he was probably blessed more than anybody, just seeing everybody coming together at this moment. What an amazing picture this is of how the body of Christ should be working together. When we work together, we can see great things accomplished for the kingdom of God when we obey His Word. That's really what body ministry is all about. Look at these verses in Romans 12. Speaking of the body ministry of Christ, it says in verse 4, For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, 
So we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. You know, and you go in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and he talks about the ministry of the body of Christ. We're all different parts, you know, fingers, hands, you know, toes, elbows. I mean, we're all different. Jesus is the head of the body. He's the one that leads us and guides us. It's not me. I'm just a talking head up here. But Jesus is the head over the body of Christ. And we want to obey Him. We want to follow His lead. But when we work together, it's amazing to see what God can do. Now, chapter 40, this is, the, to me, the climax of the book here because this is where God begins to speak and He will give them the proper order in which to erect the tabernacle. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, on the first day of the first month, you shall set up the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. You shall put in it the ark of the testimony and partition off the ark with the veil. So this is the holy of holies. You shall bring in the table and arrange the things that are to be set in order. You shall bring in the lampstand and light its lamps. You shall also set the altar of gold for the incense before the ark of the testimony and put up the screen for the door of the tabernacle, the, the, first, the second entrance. Then you shall set the altar of the burnt offering before the door of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting, and you shall set the laver, again the water, between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar, and put water in it. You shall set up the court all around, hang up the screen at the court gate, again 150 by 150 on each side, 20, 75 feet wide, you shall take the anointing oil, and remember we were given the prescription for that, and they were to sprinkle everything, everything with this anointing oil. That's why God said, you have to do it this way. You cannot copy this recipe. You couldn't use this recipe at home. It had to be only for these things of the Lord. He says, um, verse 10, you shall anoint the altar of the burnt offering and all its utensils. Consecrate the altar. The altar shall be most holy. You shall anoint the laver in its base and consecrate it. Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the door of the tabernacle of meeting and wash them with water. You shall put the holy garments on Aaron and anoint him and consecrate him that he may minister to me as priest. And you shall bring his sons and clothe them with tunics. You shall anoint them as you anointed their father that they may minister to me as priests. For their anointing shall surely be an everlasting priesthood throughout their generations. Unfortunately, what happened to two of his sons? He had four sons. Aaron, the first two, Nadab and Abihu, it wasn't very long. They're still in the wilderness. It's probably a year or two later after this. They sinned against the Lord. They offered, it says, profane fire before the Lord. And God struck them down because they did things their way instead of doing things God's way. It was a warning to all of them. God takes this very seriously. And all these things, it says, are holy to the Lord. All these little cups and forks and plates made out of gold, all these things were holy to the Lord. Now, when you look at the, uh, the book of Daniel, Babylonians come in. They destroy Solomon's temple. They take all these things from the temple and a lot of these same things that were in the tabernacle. They take them to Babylon. And then remember King Belshazzar, that's Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. It says that he gets a lot of these temple implements and he throws this big drunken party for a thousand of his guests using God's holy implements. And that's when God's hand writes on the wall. Mene, mene, tekel, you farsen. In other words, dude, your time is up. And, and he was struck dead that night because he took the holy things of God and he used them in a profane way. Your body is now the temple of the Holy Spirit. This tabernacle, you're the temple. Holy Spirit lives in us. And he wants us to live our lives in such a way that people see more of Jesus and less of us. And so, verse 16, thus Moses did according to all that the Lord had commanded him to do. So what an amazing time this was. Verse 17, And it came to pass in the first month of the second year, on the first day of the month, that the tabernacle was raised up. So when they started building to this moment, it's about six months. It took them to make this. So Moses raised up the tabernacle, fastened its sockets, set up its boards, put in its bars, raised up its pillars, 
He spread out the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering of the tent on top of it. Again, there's four layers that went over it. As the Lord commanded Moses, he took the testimony and put it into the ark. You know, the, the two tablets of the Ten Commandments he puts in the ark. Later, they would add the pot of manna that they put in there. And then Aaron's rod, his staff that budded, they put in the ark as well. Remember when the, the what was the guy's name in Indiana Jones? He opens it up and it's just sand. And, they're, oh, ho, 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 and then he, their face melts. God said, don't look in there. I mean, it's very clear. That was holy, and they did something unholy, and God melted them. I don't know why I said that, but be that as it may. Verse 20, he took the testimony, put it into the ark, inserted the poles through the rings of the ark, and put the mercy seat on top of the ark. And he brought the ark into the tabernacle, hung up the veil of the covering, and partitioned off the ark of the testimony as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put the table in the tabernacle of meeting on the north side. So when you come into the tabernacle, it would be on the right-hand side, um, the, the table there. And then he set the bread in order upon it, verse 23, as the Lord had commanded Moses. Verse 24, he put the lampstand in the tab tabernacle of meeting across from the table, so on the left side, on the south side of the tabernacle. And he lit the lamps before the Lord as the Lord had commanded Moses. And again, those lamps always had to be kept trimmed and burning. That was one of the jobs of the priests. Keep that thing burning with the oil. And again, we are the, the uh, you know, the temple of the Holy Spirit. He wants us to continually burn brightly for him. And we can't do that on our own strength. We need the Holy Spirit working in us and through us. Verse 26, he put the gold altar in the tabernacle of meeting in front of the veil, and he burned sweet incense on it as the Lord commanded Moses. That was the little 18 by 18 inch altar of incense. It's right by, uh, you can see the ark on the left side inside the Holy of Holies, the veil. And then the next thing right there is the little altar of incense. There was a special recipe for that, and that was to represent the prayers of the people. It was always burning continually, and it was representing the prayers of the people, Moses interceding on behalf of the people. We see that same altar, the real one, in heaven in the book of Revelation, and it says one of the angels goes to the altar of incense, takes the prayers of the saints, probably where they're praying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you avenge our blood on these on the earth, and then he throws the, the coals down upon the earth during the great tribulation. It was a time of judgment, but here it's a time of... Uh, intercession, to have that burning. It says in verse 30, he set the laver between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar, put water there for washing, and Moses, Aaron, and his sons would wash their hands and their feet with water from it. Whenever they went into the tabernacle of meeting and when they came near the altar, they washed as the Lord had commanded Moses. And he raised up the court all around the tabernacle in the altar and hung up the screen of the court gates so Moses finished the work. And so for the very first time, the tabernacle is set up and it's ready to go. Now, before we finish this, let me just make a couple observations here. The Bible says that there's basically three, there's three basic calls that God has on every human life. Three things that God calls every human being to do, to be part of. Number one is he wants everybody to be saved. That's his desire. That's why he sent Jesus, to be the propitiation for our sins. Not ours only, but for the sins of the world. Jesus died for everybody. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Whoever believes in him. Are you a whoever? It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how many sins you've committed. If you come to Jesus, he will give you everlasting life. Because the very next verse says, For God did not send his Son into this world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, broad is a path that leads to destruction. Most people are on that path. Sadly, unfortunately, most people are going to end up in the lake of fire. But Jesus died for everybody, and he wants us to be that light shining brightly to a lost and dying world. He wants us to rescue people, see them have their own exodus of slavery in Egypt and come into the promised land. So he calls all people to come to him. 
you know, for salvation. Uh, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all you labor and are heavy laden. You're just burdened down by the things of this world. Come to me, all of you. He says, My yoke is easy. My burden is light. He says, I'll give you rest. Revelation twenty two seventeen. And the Spirit and the bride, we're the bride of Christ, say, Come. This is what we should be telling people. Let him who hears say, Come. Let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. You know, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, come to him. You can't earn salvation. You don't deserve salvation. You can't buy your way into heaven. You can't work your way there. You just have to freely, humbly come to him and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need your salvation. And he will give you the free gift of eternal life. So that's the first thing. The second thing is once you come to Christ, he wants you to become a disciple. That means a learner. He wants you to learn about him. He wants you to be in the word of God for yourself. Not just listening to me babble on, but he wants you to study the word, to grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what he wants all of us as his children to do. And then once you're saved and you come to him and you start to learn from him, then, thirdly, God calls all of us who are saved to now serve. He didn't want you sitting on the sidelines. You know, he wants us all to serve. Use the gifts and talents that he has given you, and you know what they are. I don't always know what they are for you, but God knows, and he wants us to reach out and minister to those around us with his love with his grace, with his goodness. doesn't mean, oh, I need a position in the church before I can serve. No, we're all called to serve. You know, Elizabeth asked me years ago, you know, what are you going to do if you're not a pastor anymore? I'm going to be a Christian. Duh. No, <laughs> I didn't say that to her. Sorry. Um, no, but in my mind, I probably was thinking that. Sorry. But no, we're, we're all called to serve, you know, whether we're in, you know, profession of ministry no we're all called to be his hands his feet wherever we are so it begins in your home you know and then who, those you work with those you hang out with you're to be light and salt to anybody and everybody around us to your brothers and sisters here we're to be light and salt look at verse 34 then the cloud, so they finished the work. It says, Moses finished the work. Verse 34, then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting. This is the glory of the Lord. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Again, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. He wants you filled up with the Holy Spirit. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested Above it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Isn't that, I mean, can you imagine just being a little, whatever, you know, from the tribe of Benjamin, just some little person there, like, wow, amazing. Not one of the priests, not, but, you know, one of the important, but you're just a regular Jewish person sitting there going, can you believe this? I mean, this is amazing. The glory of the Lord coming down, filling the tabernacle. And then it says in verse 36, whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would go onward in all their journeys. Again, they had to break camp, follow the cloud. But if the cloud was not taken up, they did not journey till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by day, and the fire was over it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. And so what an awesome way to close out the book of Exodus. God gives his people, in a sense, a seal of approval. You know, that they've done everything that he commanded. And he fills the tabernacle with his glory and his presence. Again, what an awesome sight this must have been. The all-consuming fire at the same time as the non-consuming fire. That's God. Burns bright, burns hot, but doesn't consume. Remember the first time Moses met God? It was at the burning bush. And that's why he stopped. He goes, well, that bush isn't burning up. This is weird. And he goes up to it and God says, hey, take off your sandals. You're on holy ground. Who are you, Lord? I am the Lord. And then he says, I am that I am. That's how you're going to reveal yourself to the children of Israel. I am has sent me to you. 
So Moses, he's gone from fleeing for his life when he was in Egypt, and he goes before Pharaoh, speaking face to face with his, you know, to Pharaoh, and, and then he becomes known to God, and he knows God, and it says he knew God as a friend, speaking face to face to the Lord. Remember in chapter 34, he wants to see God, and God says, nobody can see me and live, but this is what I'll do. I'll put you in the cleft of the rock, and when I pass by, I'll put my hand over the rock, and you'll see my afterglow when I pass by. And then it says God revealed his name to Moses. That's how God reveals his nature, his character to us through his name. And as he passed by, he says, The Lord, the Lord God, gracious and merciful, abounding in mercy and truth, forgiving iniquity and sin and wickedness. I mean, he just reveals himself in such an amazing way to Moses. And Moses grew in his relationship with the Lord. He didn't make it into the promised land. Third, next 39 years, he's going to be wandering out there with these people in the next generation after the first generation dies off. He didn't get into the promised land then, but you know what? He made it. When? At the Mount of Transfiguration. When Jesus is transfigured and Peter, James, and John are up there, and who appears? Moses and Elijah. And they were recognizable. He didn't say, who is that, Lord? He goes, no, that's Moses. That's Elijah. Let's make three tabernacles for him. And so Moses does finally make it in during that time. And he will be, I think, one of the two witnesses there in Jerusalem in the book of Revelation. But like Moses, may we have that strong desire to know God more, to grow in our relationship with Jesus Christ, to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit as he speaks to us from his word, and so what is God's will for your life? I really don't know specifically, but here's how I, uh, what I do know. God has published for us his will and is found in one place, and you're holding it in your hand. Not your iPhone, if your Bible's there. It's in your Bible. That's where he's revealed his will to us. And the better you know the written word of God, the better you will hear the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. You won't hear from the Lord unless you get into the Word of God. And He will speak words of joy and peace and comfort, encouragement, whatever He has for you, whatever you need from Him, you will hear as you spend time in His Word. And that is how this book ends with great hope, great trust in the Lord. Even though the people messed up big time, even though they sinned greatly against God, here's what they found, forgiveness. I don't know, I do know, some of you have messed up big time, some of you have really blown it, and yet, I want to encourage you, you can find grace, you can discover that God will never break His promise. You confess your sins to Him, He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you of all unrighteousness, because it's the blood of Jesus that cleanses us of all sin. And that's just as true for you and me today, that you will find His promises to be yes and amen. Nothing, I mean absolutely nothing, can separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Let me close with these verses. It's Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son. I mean, he, he sent Jesus to die, to take the wrath of God we deserve upon himself. So if God didn't spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. So the Lord's praying for you. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. We have a lot of brothers and sisters throughout the world who are being beaten, tortured, Martyred? You think these verses don't ring loud and true for them? 
They're, they're counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet, verse 37, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's his promise to you. He's got you safe and secure in his hands. He's not going to let go. Hang on to him. Go with the flow of whatever this world throws at you. Know that he is bigger. He is stronger. He will give you the victory ultimately. The worst thing that can happen to any of us, we die. That's the best thing because then we get promoted. Death for us is promotion day when we get to go into the presence of the Lord. I talked about this last night at the, at the camp up at Vega. You know, we did a church service up there, and, you know, the best is yet to come. We're going to see our Lord and Savior face to face. All the trials, struggles we go through down here are going to seem like nothing when we see Him in His glory. It's going to be awesome. You know, the Apostle Paul, when he's writing from prison, he says, for to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. He says, I'm caught between the two because I have a desire, really. He goes, I have a desire to depart and be with Christ. But to be here with you guys, yeah, it's needful for now. But I'm caught between the two because I'd rather go home to be with Christ, which he says is far better. Those are the words he uses, far better. I asked the people up there, I'll ask you now, just, I had them raise their hands, they gave a bunch of responses, you don't, please don't do that now. Um, I said, think of the most exhilarating, the greatest moment you've had here on earth. What's the most awesome thing? Karis having a baby. Maybe that was on her list. Well, maybe getting married to Matt was first, I don't know. But I'm just throwing that out there. Think, what was the most amazing thing you've ever experienced here on earth? Just think about that. Me getting married to Elizabeth? I don't deserve her. That was tops. But when you get to heaven, it says, whatever you've experienced here, it's going to be far better being in heaven with the Lord, seeing Him. Oh, well, maybe it's the birth of your child, birth of your grandchild, you know, a new puppy. <laughs> No, I mean, whatever it was, and you think, man, this vacation I went on, it was amazing, just the waterfalls, it was glorious. Being in the presence of the Lord is far better. Don't ever forget that. You know, we see through a glass dimly right now, Paul says, but then face to face. Now we know in part, but then we'll know fully, even as we're fully known. I'm looking forward to seeing the Lord. I don't know when it's going to be. I think for the bride of Christ, it could be at any moment. He's going to blow the trumpet. We'll be out of here. Dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with Him in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Awesome. Amazing. I can't wait for the rapture of the church. But if it's delayed for whatever reason, the Lord knows the timing. He says, occupy until I come. Keep living for Jesus Keep serving the Lord. Keep being a witness to those around you until He comes and takes you home. Every year we do, I don't know, every year I do two or three funerals, sometimes more, sometimes less. But for those who know Jesus, it's a celebration of life because they are now at home. They're at peace. They're at rest with their Lord and Savior. So let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for all those who've gone through the book of Exodus with us. And they hung in there all these months. And Lord, we look forward to next week, if we're still here, we look forward to going through the book of Acts together. And so, Father, I pray you prepare our hearts for what you have for each one of us. Lord, we thank you for just the, the amazing things that we saw with Moses and how you took that timid, frightened man and used him in such an amazing way. And Paul tells Timothy that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And so, Lord, I pray that we would walk in your power, we'd walk in your love, we would have our minds set on things above, where you're seated. Not on the things of this earth, for we have died and our life is hidden with God in Christ Jesus. And so, Lord, I thank you for all my brothers and sisters that are here today. I pray that you would bless them. For all the dads here, I pray you would bless their Father's Day Lord, we thank you for using, uh, I'll speak personally, a goofus, doofus like me to be a dad. 
uh, to my two wonderful daughters. One's now in Sweden, one's now in Mexico. Happy Father's Day to me. So, Father, we thank you for your grace, your mercy, your love for us. We thank you that in our weakness, you are strong. And, th Father, we thank you for your amazing grace. May you continue to use us as vessels of honor for your glory all the days of our life. Help us to wear that badge across our foreheads, holiness to the Lord. May people see more of Jesus. Like John the Baptist said, may I decrease, may Jesus increase. And so, Lord, we lay our lives down before you once again and pray that your Holy Spirit would fill us up, overflowing with the rivers of living water, that your joy, your peace, your, your patience, just the fruit would be produced in abundance in all of our lives, and people would see Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.